Um, so I'm really excited to introduce our 10th um, CCC speaker today, Dr. Caitlin Rivers. Uh, Dr. Rivers is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, and um, I'm really excited to have her here today. Her, her research focuses on improving epidemic preparedness and response through the use of modeling and forecasting, um, data standards and data sharing, and public health policy. Um, and on top of her, you know, really important work on various emerging diseases like H7N9, uh, Ebola, and MERS, I really see her as one of the foremost thought leaders in our field in terms of thinking about all of the factors and considerations that go into a public health response to an emerging epidemic. And, um, you know, she's really been an advocate for open data standards and data sharing. Um, probably she first came in, or I first noticed her when she was um, advocating for open data with the West African Ebola epidemic, where you know, she really took it upon herself to create this clean epidemi epidemiological data set from the messy situation reports coming out of West Africa. Um, and it was really, in my mind, and I could be wrong here, someone correct me if I'm wrong, it was like the first real-time open data set being used for understanding an emerging epidemic. And I think what we're seeing today is a lot of people following in her footsteps. Um, I, Johns Hopkins data set, the New York Times data set, the COVID tracking project, I think these are all following um, the lead that she, she showed in that West African Ebola epidemic. Um, she also has been advocating for an interdisciplinary um, field called outbreak science, which is, is basically thinking about how um, multifaceted approaches to responding to um, emerging epidemics and um, how to include infectious disease modeling and um, combining it with traditional epidemiological methods to assist in responses most successfully. One of those facets is in outlining um, and advocating for forecasting of infectious diseases where she's recently, or maybe not so recently, maybe she's been talking about this for a few years now, but um, the National Infectious Disease Forecasting Center, um, similar to a weather forecasting initiative. Um, and just a quick summary of some of her incredible COVID work. Um, she has, has worked on understanding how syndromic surveillance systems like um, the influenza-like illness surveillance system um, can be used to detect COVID-19. Um, she estimated U.S. healthcare de demands using early data from China. And really, I think um, her group has been one of the, the strongest kind of national leaders um, in coordinating states' responses to COVID-19 and, and how um, they should, you know, really tailor their policy to current situations. Um, releasing a COVID-19 roadmap for reopening, a uh, public health risk assessment document as guidance for governors as they consider what um, things to reopen and, and um, how to kind of tighten and loosen restrictions. And then recently, as we discussed last week, um, she was serving on the committee of the National Academy of Sciences for the reopening school document. Um, so with that, I'll let her take it away. And I think she'll be telling us about quite a bit of that right now. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thank you too for the kind introduction. I was hoping to share with you all today a project I've been working on for quite a while with my collaborator Simon Pellet about um, a consensus process that we undertook on uh, epidemic reporting on epidemic guidelines. So if you are producing an epidemic model, particularly forecasting, what sorts of things should you include in your report? But unfortunately, that is still an agency clearance, which I think many of you can relate to. And so it's not ready yet. And instead, I'm going to talk about a report that I am um, planning to release probably next week, but I'm still drafting, about how the U.S. should, what policy actions the U.S. should put into place in order to get out of this mess and turn the corner and really get back to a place where we have a manageable outbreak. Um, there's about 10 recommendations. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I will hit the highlights. So I'll just share my screen. All right, the first recommendation is around reclosing. This is a discussion that has been ongoing since the recent resurgence. And I think it's really important to enumerate for decision makers that reclosing high risk activities and settings is an option. And that if jurisdictions are on track to have healthcare systems that are overwhelmed in particular, reclosing should be, I think, one of our priorities. Now, that's not to say that we need to lock down like we did in the spring. I think we've learned enough about what activities and settings are highest risk that we can target those and we can make sure that we still leave open 
the activities that are safer and that contribute to our economy. So it's really about finding a balance. But what I'm seeing in many of the states that are experiencing a severe outbreak, again, there's a reluctance to go back to that more restricted state. And so I wanted to start with one of the stronger um, policy proposals. Now, when I'm thinking through policy actions, I always try to go as deep as I can in saying, what exactly do I mean by that? And what would the triggers be? And so this is what I'm currently at, but I, I might still play with it a little bit and would be anxious to hear your thoughts. But the criteria for triggering a reclosing um, action that I would propose are if hospital systems are within three weeks of becoming stressed and if, if current trajectories continue. Now, what does stressed mean? It's a little bit hard to determine stress for healthcare systems because there's a lot of excess capacity that could be squeezed out if you need to. Now, we don't really want to be in a position where we need to be doing that, but um, nonetheless, sometimes the numbers you see of like available beds are not, not as far, actually, as we can take uh, capacity. So we are defining stressed healthcare systems here as requiring exceptional arrangements to accommodate patients, including canceling elective procedures, relocating patients out of the local health system, and or rationing care. And so we propose combining the health of the hospital system stress metric with uh, clear indications that the outbreak is still accelerating. If, as Lauren described in Austin, we're starting to see uh, signs that things are turning the corner, you may not be in such a tight spot. But if your hospital system is on track to be become overwhelmed and you're still racking up more new cases each day and the percent of tests that come back positive is high, those are bad signs. And so that's what I'm kind of um, um, inching towards for decision makers to implement reclosures. Recommendations two and three I'll combine here for um, for speed, but I've seen enormous and persistent problems in the personal protective equipment and testing supply chains. These are critical components, both of uh, medical care and of public health containment efforts, and there's still a lot of opacity around how those supply chains are operating and what more we could be doing to bolster them. And as our outbreak is again reaching a, a, a really um, acceleration phase, I anticipate that those bottlenecks be, will become even more severe. And it's not just in the US, it's really the entire world that shares the same PPE supply chain. And so as it accelerates in all of the other countries in the world, that's going to draw down our supply chain as well. And I think we should that should be um, a bigger part of the national conversation. And around testing, not only are there still many communities that are not able to receive timely access to tests, even for people who are symptomatic, which would be a, a top priority, uh, but but certainly not the other priorities for testing that we would like to expand into. We don't have a lot of information about how testing is going generally. And so I recommend that the federal government should bolster those supply chains to the extent that they're able, but also make available to the public more information about how our supply chains are doing and what more we could be doing again to bolster them. And just one more point about testing. I, bre oops, I breezed over it, but, but I, I do think it's an important point that we want to make sure, of course, that we have enough testing for everyone who is experiencing COVID-like symptoms. But in order to be able to reincorporate more activities and to do that safely around university reopening, for example, we would like to be able to use testing as part for people who are asymptomatic and don't have any known exposure in order to buy down the risk of an outbreak. And right now, with even symptomatic patients not being able to receive timely test results, it's really, it's kind of difficult to imagine how we would be able to expand into that those other settings. And so I think that is a gap that's holding us back from the economic revitalization that I think we're all um, hoping for, at least in partnership with um, improving our public health response. Now, as we are thinking again about relying on community mitigation uh, to reduce transmission in our communities, we are back in the position that we are in March and April of having to think about how we will transition from community mitigation into case-based interventions. If we are able to reduce transmission substantially through everyone staying home, for example, what we cannot do, which is what we did last time, is just open things back up and expect that we will get a different result. That's not how it works. We need to be able to identify alternate means of controlling transmission. And I think the testing, the tracing, and the isolation that we are all um, intimately familiar with at this point after months of talking about it, that's our way out. And so we need to continue to hit this as a national priority. We cannot just go back to lockdowns, open up again, and expect to get different results. And so what decision makers should be doing in order to achieve this vision is, first of all, to develop a national strategy for how state and local health departments can do this. It's going to rely a lot on scaling up the case-based intervention capacities, which, again, is the diagnostic testing, but it's also the contact tracers, the case investigators, 
we do this process in every community, but we don't have anywhere near the capacity that we need to in order to have even a tiny fraction of the number of cases that we currently have. Even if we're able to bring transmission way down, I think there's still gonna be a gap between what we can manage with contact tracing. And so we need to keep building those capacities up. Skipping recommendation five, because it wasn't as interesting. Um, Congress should fund the NSF and NIH to administer a rapid research agenda to cope with the challenges that have arisen. I see in other countries that there are major and rapid research efforts that have really been successful in informing the way that they are managing their outbreak. And I don't see as much energy around that in the United States. I'm thinking specifically about the ISARIC or ISARIC research network in the UK, which um, collects data on severe acute respiratory disease patients throughout the country and aggregates it. And they have been just manufacturing, pumping out really amazing research results that have been able to inform the clinical management of patients experiencing severe respiratory disease. I think we should be doing something like that. I think that we should also, I think I have a list actually. I think we should also be thinking about how can we improve ventilation systems and buildings? How can we do that quickly and inexpensively? This is gonna be a particular priority in schools, which are closed indoor settings, often with poor ventilation. If we're able to identify through research efforts, ways to improve those ventilation, that would be helpful. We need more innovations in face coverings. It seems clear that we're not going to have enough personal protective equipment for everyone who deserves it, but maybe there are innovations that can help us to expand that capacity and pull in new, um, new innovations. Social science research. How can we encourage universal masking? How do we make remote learning work? What are the best mechanisms for engaging in marginalized groups? This is all really important research and I'm sure a lot of it is already underway, but I'm not sure that it's receiving the attention and the funding and the coordination that it should in order to be most effective. And I am certain that it is not being effectively drawn into the decision-making process. As we've talked about I, with many, as I've talked about with many of you in other settings, a lot of amazing research happens in academia, but getting that into the decision-making cycle when it matters is a non-trivial problem. But I think if we were to have some sort of um, formalized research agenda, then we would be able to close that loop a little bit quicker. And then of course, there are a number of epidemiological studies that I think should uh, be of critical top priority for the country. We need to know a lot more about the role of children in transmission. We need to know more about aerosol and fomite transmission. Again, the decisions we make about how we control our outbreak will really hinge on the results of these studies. And so I think it's uh, kind of crazy actually at this point that we're still really in the dark in some ways. And finally, this will be my last recommendation that I share with the group, but happy to discuss, is that we need to be planning for a vaccine. It is not just about getting through phase three trials. It's not just about finding a safe and effective vaccine. We need to produce it. We need to distribute it. We need to decide who's going to get it first. These are all major logistical problems. And I heard President Trump at the task force briefing last night say that he is a sort of a general waiting in the wings to make all of this happen. That's the first I've heard that that's the case. And if so, I guess that's more promising than not knowing that it's the case. But nonetheless, it feels like there's a lot more to do. How are we gonna manufacture all of this product, particularly when we don't know which product is gonna get over the finish line? How do we get it into our communities? How do we convince people that it's safe and effective? Who's gonna get it first? These are all questions that we need to hammer out and now is the time to do it. It's not going to be the time when the vaccine is ready and we don't know exactly what to do with it. And so in closing, just to reiterate, this will be a, a laundry list of policy priorities that I think that um, it's targeted for federal, uh, the federal government, but also state and local decision makers. And I plan to include an actor or a responsible party for each of them and hope that it can help to shape some of the conversation around what the country should be doing now to turn the corner.